You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. OIC offers a variety of resources to those interested in learning more about options, including live seminars, webcasts, and podcasts. Check out www.optionseducation.org for more information. Now here's your host, OIC's Director of Retail Education. Education, Joe Burgoyne. Welcome to OIC's Why World of Options. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Let's get started with industry happenings. It's time to get a handle on the latest developments from the world of options. It's time for industry happenings. In today's industry happenings, I'd like to get you up to date on the NASDAQ purchase of ISE, the International Securities Exchange. On June 30th, the NASDAQ did acquire the ISE from Deutsche Börse Group. The acquisition included three U.S. options exchanges, ISE, ISE Gemini, and ISE Mercury. That reduces the number of option exchange parent companies to six. NASDAQ. SIBO, NYSE, BATS, BOX, and MIAX. I'll offer a brief history of ISE in today's Looking Back segment. That's it for today's industry happenings. It's time to break down the latest option strategies. It's time for Strategy Spotlight. Joining us today on Strategy Spotlight is Randy Frederick, Managing Director of Trading and Derivatives at Schwab. Welcome, Randy. Well, uh, thank you. It's good to be here. Glad you could join us today. Uh, you know, before we get into today's topic, which is, you know, we're going to focus on option spreads, specifically Delta spreads. Uh, for those of our listeners who may not know you, how about if you tell us a little bit about yourself and then what you do at Schwab? Okay. Well, um, I've been in the industry for a long time, about 28 years altogether, and I've spent the last 23 of those at Schwab. Um, options in some manner have always been an area of focus for me. Um, what my prime, what my current uh, role involves are things like research and analysis, so that's things like writing blogs, which I publish every Friday. Um, sometimes we have a daily blog that my assistant Nate puts out. I write that one on occasion. Send out tweets just about every day through Twitter. I also do education, so that involves things like live events, um, writing articles for our websites and newsletters, and also podcasts, which we do about every week. And then my third area is I do PR and commentary, so I speak to reporters every day, and of course that could be via radio, television, or print media. So uh, they keep me plenty busy. Indeed they do. Um, for our listeners who want to 
do you have to be a Schwab uh, customer in order to get your releases or some of those blogs outside of the Schwab universe? Yeah, probably, I don't know what percentage, but I would say probably 80 to 90% of all of the educational and research content that we make available on Schwab are available on what we call our prospect site. So that's just schwab.com that you don't have to log in to get it. There is some stuff that's available only to our clients that you can get after you log in, but a good number of, of, uh, of our, a, good, a fair amount of our content is available on the, um, on the website without logging in. So you don't have necessarily have to be a Schwab customer. Okay, that's great to know because I know you put out you know a lot of wonderful information. So uh, your listeners out there, that's Schwab.com. You'll be able to track a lot of uh, Randy's different opinions. Uh, so backing up a little bit, as I mentioned, uh, the current education theme at OIC is spreads, and I think I'd like to have you focus on the idea of delta spreads. How about if you start by maybe defining what a delta spread is? Yeah, so a delta spread is a kind of a unique kind of spread. It's not one that would typically come up on most retail traders' website or, I mean, um, on their uh, sort of their radar screen, if you will. But essentially a, a delta spread, which is sometimes called also a delta neutral strategy, is really a spread that involves um, – it's usually at least a two-legger, sometimes a three- or a four-legger that involves offsetting – um, the long and short legs, not the way most people think of spreads by having an equal number of contracts, but instead offsetting it by having an equal aggregate delta. So in other words, um, you, the, the, the total combined delta of your long position would be close to, not exact, but generally very close to the total combined delta of your short position. And so therefore they kind of offset each other. And really the, the purpose of the strategy is to neutralize the impact of the price movement of the underlying security so that you can take advantage of something like the time erosion curve, generally. Okay, so that's delta neutral spreading. Um, but if you're, if you're offsetting uh, the time decay, how are you making money? Well, you're not offsetting the time decay. You're offsetting the, the, the impact of the price change. So your time decay is actually where your, where your money comes from. So a good example would be, say, a calendar spread, right? If I did a, an at-the-money calendar spread where I sold a front-month option at the money and I bought one that was two or three months out at the money, the deltas would be very close to 50. So one's going to be long 50, the other one's going to be short 50. So they essentially neutralize each other. And then I just sit there and do nothing. And then what happens is, assuming that the price of the underlying stock stays relatively flat, the time erosion curve of the short option is much steeper than the time erosion curve of the long option. And as the time erodes, it takes away value of both options, but it takes away value on the short option much quicker. And so therefore, I benefit from that time decay curve. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So, uh, you know, from a delta neutral perspective, are there other spreads that you consider from a delta neutral perspective? Well, yeah, some that I think people are pretty familiar with um, are like butterflies and condors or iron butterflies and iron condors. And these are strategies that if you do a long butterfly or a long condor or a short iron butterfly or a short iron condor, these are strategies typically where the benefit or, the, or I should say the, the intent is to, bene is to take advantage of, again, the time erosion. Generally, you put one of these strategies on when the stock – price is pretty much right in the middle of all of the strike prices that you're dealing with. You buy or sell at a low on a low strike, then you do twice as many in the middle, and then you buy or sell at the high end, and the net of all of those deltas offsets each other. And then again, you sit tight if things if the stock stays relatively stable over time, all of these options essentially lose value. And because you take in a credit up front, then um, at least on an iron, you would take in credit up front, then you get to keep that credit. If you do a, re a traditional type, then you end up at the end um, with options that expire, but then the ones that you're long actually end up worth more than what you paid for them, and you can close those out at a net profit. So again, the whole benefit here is to try to take price movement out of the picture and just take a benefit from the uh, time erosion. And um, how about the risks associated with these spreads? Are they uh, are they even in terms of the number of contracts you're long and short, or are you, you know, long more or short more contracts? Well, there, it depends, again, on how you do this. I, a, a delta spread or a, a delta neutral strategy is not always even. So another example might be, say, you could do like a diagonal ratio spread where you could be, say, short two 
de- two options with a high delta, and then you could, or I'm sorry, you could be short like one option with a high delta, but then you could buy two options with a with a delta that's approximately half of that amount, and there again, you'd offset the deltas completely, but um, in that example, I'm long twice as many as I'm short. If I did it in reverse, where I where I shorted two low delta options and then bought one high delta option that offset the deltas, in that scenario, I'd actually end up with a naked, with one with one option that's a naked. We call it a ratio spread, but technically, one of the options in that scenario is naked. So it is possible in ratio scenario that you could be um, exposed quite a bit because one was naked. Now, if you're talking about a traditional condor or butterfly then no, you've got the same number of long and short. And overall, like any other spread, the benefit here is that you can always calculate that maximum gain and that maximum loss before you get into it. So um, your risk is, um, is is defined ahead of time in those scenarios. And, and that's, uh, that's the condor, the iron, or the butterfly. But let me go back to that right. ratio uh, diagonal you spoke to, because mm-hmm. once we start talking diagonals, you talked about naked, that's where you know we can potentially get into a lot more risk. Can you speak to right. that a little bit? Yeah. So, and so a couple of things. First of all, most brokers like Schwab have different levels of option approval that they'll allow their clients to trade at. So, for example, things like covered call writing or buying a protective put is pretty low level generally. But when you start talking about trading options strategies that involve naked options. Uh, the risks go up quite a bit. So generally, there's a higher requirement for an income, a net worth, and um, even a portfolio value in order to trade those types of strategies. And generally, most brokers are going to want customers that are thinking about doing those types of strategies to have a fair amount of experience of trading options in the past. Because, you know, again, an option is can be a very safe instrument, but it can also be very dangerous if it's being traded by someone who doesn't fully understand the dynamics, and that's where you have to be careful. When you trade any option, um, that involves a naked call, you've got a potentially unlimited amount of risk. When you trade a strategy that involves a naked put, you've got risk all the way down to zero, so it's pretty substantial there as well. Again, when I, I, to me, to some extent, calling this a spread is a little bit of a misnomer for someone who's not familiar with them because generally you think of spreads as being offset by having an equal number of long and short, but ratio spreads are the one exception where that's not the case. And, you know, when it comes to spreads, do, do you, you know, have a preference, especially in this delta neutral space, in terms of the type of spreads that you prefer to do? Yeah, I'd say my favorite kind of delta neutral spread is probably an iron condor. And the reason I say that is because, um, well, first of all, it doesn't involve any naked options like we were just talking about. And second of all, Unlike a traditional butterfly or condor or even an iron butterfly, this strategy is one where you bring in a credit up front, and if the strategy plays out the way you hope it will, in the end, everything expires worthless, and you don't have any long positions that you have to dispose of. You don't end up with any long or short stock positions, nothing. You just basically don't have to do anything. All the options essentially expire worthless and disappear, and then you just keep the credit that you got paid up front. That's the unique benefit of that particular type of, of four-legger um, is that it requires the least amount of, of um, maintenance at the end, if you will. You don't have to do anything at all. If it all plays out right, then you don't have to do anything. And if it doesn't play out right, walk me through you know, maybe a hypothetical example just so our listeners know how to react and what to do. Right. So the the whole point in these types of strategies is for the stock under, underneath or the ETF, I guess it could be, to remain relatively flat. If you have a sharp movement in one direction or the other, one side or the other of your condor could end up in the money. And you ultimately end up um, – there's two really two possible scenarios. You either end up where the stock moves up to where it's in between a long and a short leg, in which case you're going to end up with either a long position in the stock or a short position in the stock – that you have to then close out in the market. Or if the stock rises enough to be above both sides, or both legs on one side or both legs on the other side, then you end up essentially um, acquiring a position and then having it closed, having it assigned and taken away from you at the exact same time at expiration. In which case, you don't have to do anything there either, but you end up with a net loss. That's the thing. If your goal is for the stock to stay stable to hit your profit margins, if the stock moves too far up or too far down, you end up with a net loss. Um, it's probably almost better in some sense to have it go way out of the money in one direction or the other, so then it, you're just done with it, um, even though you're taking a loss, because then you don't end up stuck with a position. 
this is why I think it's kind of critical on these strategies is that you should always, always calculate how much you could potentially lose before you go into any of these. And you should be comfortable with what that amount is before you enter these, these positions. Cause, um, in most cases with most spreads, and these are no different, the majority of the profits oftentimes don't come until you get very close to the end. So you're most of the time going to want to hang on to these until they hit expiration or close to it. Uh, good advice there, and that actually dovetails into the last thing I wanted to ask you, Randy, and that, that goes to the amount of time that you leave your option positions on, be it individual positions or spreads. You know, Do you have any recipe, or is it kind of a you know, as-you-go type approach? Because, I, I, you know, as we know, options expire. So do you have any insights on that? Yeah, I do have kind of a, a sort of a rule of thumb. I mean, most of the time, as I said, I allow the spreads to run their course until expiration. But I, my rule of thumb is essentially – it's a pretty simple comp calculation. I, I basically take the um, – I divide the maximum gain – and again, you can calculate that ahead of time – by the timeline of the strategy. In other words, how much time do I have until the expiration? And then I check it on at least a weekly basis to make sure – or to kind of check to see if I'm ahead or behind the game. So what I mean by that, let me give you an example. So let's say I put a spread on. Yeah, let's say I put a spread on, and the plan is the maximum gain is $400, and this spread's going to last for four weeks until expiration. Each week I take a look at it, and I see if I'm, if I'm ahead or behind the game. Sometimes you get a, a certain spreads you make money if the stock does move. Others you make it if it doesn't. So what I do is I take a look at – what the pricing is to close out the spread after the first week. And if after the first week I'm up $300, I'd close that spread out in a minute. And the reason I say that is because I've, I've waited one week and I've made three quarters. I've, I've waited a quarter of my time, but I've already made three quarters of my money. In that case, it doesn't one. make, yeah. And that way it doesn't make sense for me to make an, wait another three weeks to make an extra hundred. I'd close that one out. On the other hand, if you check the spread after three weeks and you're only up a hundred, then you have the potential to make the extra 300 after one more week. I'd wait on, I'd wait that one out. Um, the third scenario, of course, is after two weeks, you're up 200. That's a coin flip. You decide whether it's worth the risk. Cause the thing is about a spread in, in any other strategy really is that just because you're in the money right now, doesn't mean that that's going to stay that way. It could change. The price could move big. And when you get big moves in the market, like we've been seeing here lately, you're in the money today, tomorrow, you're out of the money. Um, if you can take some money off the table, a lot of times it's a good idea. But that's kind of the rough rule of thumb that I use. But the goal, again, typically is to wait until expiration, and that way you can hit the max profit. And how about uh, on the flip side, you know, if the spread's going against you? Now, granted, in a lot of those scenarios, you had your max loss. But let's say, you know, you got a four-week trade and you're two weeks in and you've lost X. I mean, do you, do you have a, a stop loss in terms of, uh, you know, cutting, cutting losses? Yeah, that's kind of a personal preference. I don't. I generally don't. Like I said, I calculate the maximum loss before I get into the spread. I decide that I'm comfortable with that amount. I realize that if it doesn't play out like I think that I can hit that max loss, then I'm. My goal is to just hold it till expiration. Because again, I might be underwater three weeks into it, and then all the profits come in in the fourth week and not only wipe out the loss but get me into the gain. Um, if you close out early, you, you miss that opportunity. If you put on a spread that you're not comfortable with the max loss, you're probably taking on more risk than you ought to. Now, maybe your opinion on the underlying changes over time. If that happens, maybe some news comes out, there's an earnings report, whatever it might be, that changes your whole perspective on, on the stock, and you don't think that what you originally thought could happen could happen now, well, then maybe it does make some sense to take it off. But assuming that your perspective on the underlying is the same now as it was at the beginning, Generally, I don't close any. I don't close out early for a loss. I'll close out early for a profit. Rarely do I ever close out early for a loss. Randy, that is just uh, a wealth of information. Under 15 minutes. I mean, the beauty of uh, of these online uh, shows is that our listeners can go back because I mean, you offered an awful lot. All great information. It's great to have you on the show. And uh, any closing thoughts for our listeners? Um. I don't know. I guess the question that I often get is, you know, do I put on, do I prefer spreads that where I pay money up front or where I get paid up front? Personally, I'd always rather take a credit in. And the reason I like that is because it's a more passive strategy. I think we're all looking for things that we can profit on that we don't have to keep an eye on really close. I don't want to go out and play golf and come home and find out I lost a ton of money or be on an airplane, which I am a lot, and find out when I get off that I got clobbered. 
um, spreads that pay a credit up front generally are passive. You sit tight and you wait for time erosion to work in your favor because it's important for people to realize, and this is something that new option traders learn the hard way, time erosion can be your friend or your enemy. You want it to be your friend, and the way you want it to be your friend is you want to put on strategies that as time goes away, it works to your benefit. So a credit spread of any kind typically is a better setup from my perspective. Randy, um, you know, our listeners can find you at schwab.com. I can't thank you enough for all the great information. Hope to see you on the road before too long. Joe, it was my pleasure. It's time to meet the movers and shakers from the world of options. It's time for profiles and perspectives. Joining us today on Profiles and Perspectives is Don Prattle of Trade Station. Don, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for asking. Um, as uh, we were just mentioning a few minutes ago, it's a great day in the market and a great day for options traders. There are always good days for options traders. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more, having spent 20-plus uh, years on, on a trading floor in Philadelphia. But uh, how about if, uh, you know, if our listeners uh, maybe aren't so familiar with uh, – you personally, and, and I'm sure many of the listeners are uh, with TradeStation, how about if you start by telling us how you got into this business, Don? Well, uh, actually, it's uh, uh, kind of a, uh, I, I won't say by accident, but, I, you know, back in the 80s when I graduated from college, I had some friends that uh, were uh, already employed at the, you know, fledgling CBOE it was kind of early in its development stage at that point, and I went there uh, for a summer job. I had graduated uh, with a, a history degree. I was planning on teaching at a secondary school somewhere in the Chicago area and ended up making a career of it. Um, it I actually never looked back. Um, started as a runner on the CBOE floor, moved up to handling um, institutional orders on a major wirehouse desk, uh, and then actually spent some time in the CBOE marketing department in the 80s as well as the member firm uh, relations manager, and that that was a lot of fun, and it got me out into the you know nuts and bolts of the industry, meeting uh, sales reps at, in their branches as they um, and and help them assisted with them along with some CBOE members. We had this program called the Branch Visitation Program where we would actually go into branches and, and do seminars for um, for brokers and public um, events as well. I went back to the trading floor in the 90s uh, working as a floor broker for a, a couple different uh, entities and uh, straight through into the new century, you know, I, everybody survived the, new, the uh, you know, the, the millennium uh, <laughs> problems that we expected we didn't get. And of course, uh, lived through a couple of crashes along the way in the, um, the World Trade Center crash of uh, 2001 as well. Now, you know, after that, we, you probably all, all of us from uh, the trading floor perspective, ran into the competition with electronic traders, electronic trading systems, um, electronic brokerage, and so I decided not to. If I couldn't beat them, I was going to join them, and I've been working uh, for online brokers since 2005. A uh, few years back, when. Uh, uh, my friend, Dr. J, John and Jerry, and started uh, the the trade uh, trade monster, and I'm going to plug that a little bit because it's no longer a, a, a label that we can that you know that competes with anybody these days. Uh, he started up the trade monster brokerage, and uh, I spent time there as the uh, uh, director of uh, education and trader development, which led me into this role at Trade Station. Um, which um, has always been an industry leader for day traders and, uh, you know, is well noted in the industry, well known in the industry as a firm that catered to, you know, lots of research with wonderful research tools and good executions. Um, my role here is to dive into the lower echelon of the retail market and try to, you know, make 
make the uh, trading platform less daunting. I'm sure that all of you um, in the in the industry have had uh, problems, you know, um, getting people to jump off into the into the mix. Um, and you know, all of us from trading floors know the hardest trade to make is that first one. Um, so we're trying to uh, work on some programs here that are going to uh, help our customers uh, be comfortable with the trading platform and the marketplace in general. Um, there's a lot of really good education programs in the industry, uh, third-party educators uh, that are not affiliated with brokerage houses do a great job of preparing people uh, with understanding the the intricacies of trading strategies and, and how they, you know, what market uh, situations you employ them in. Uh, you know, what we find is that sometimes customers just need a little more encouragement. And so we've begun to ramp up our strategy here on making people comfortable with our trading platform. Well, um, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more that that first trade uh, is so, so important because, uh, you know, investors can study for days, months, years, but, uh, boy, that learning curve just increases exponentially if you put on that first, you know, options trade. So tell me a little bit about how you are, you know, getting people and investors to that point, Don. I've had success in the past, as I mentioned, with uh, uh you know, the, my experience in the wirehouse, um, where uh, back in the 80s, uh, where we realized that uh, compliance offices made options trading um, less, you know, uh, not very desirable for stockbrokers to recommend for their customers, uh, branch managers who controlled order flow or, or uh, broker activity were pretty much of the opinion that options didn't pay enough commission to the brokers, and it accounted for an awful lot of the branch's compliance problems. And we know that options have evolved and become more of a staple in many folks' um, trading strategies um, in, you know, these days. But uh, there is, you know, some, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ideas, I think, still persists in, with, uh, with, in, with retail investors that they, uh, they'd like to be a trader, uh, but they uh, are not sure that it's, they, they might think it's too complicated for them. I, you know, I do some college adjunct work in the Chicago area, and I find that, you know, students have really no idea what options are. Um, so when we introduce that topic in different classes, uh, business management and, and uh, in different finance classes, we, you know, we, we try to uh, bring about, you know, some real world um, experience for the students. So that's one way that my personal mission brings uh, is trying to create more options traders. But here at TradeStation, what we've employed and what we'll begin later this month is our I Want to Be a Trader program. Where we're going to use um, some great industry talent in um, helping customers uh, move into this idea of, you know, uh, of using more, you know, different products uh, that uh, not, not being so concerned about that, you know, they're, they're um, you know, allowing you, helping them find some trading opportunities and using our tools to use, uh, to analyze the markets and execute options orders. And how about, you know, uh, for our listeners who, you know, have no intentions at all to becoming, you know, like a full-time options trader, you know, the old uh, nuts and bolts income generation, maybe risk management, are there any special approaches to giving them the confidence to take that first step? Well, you know, we, we've ramped up our education effort, as I said here. Uh, we've always been a leader in um, the education uh, of, of traders, but we want to focus on those traders who might be hesitant to join the marketplace. Uh, we talked to them about, you know, so we've, we've uh, you know, some ideas that I think, um, you know, work really well, you know, what people can expect uh, as they begin their trading journey. Um, so we've uh, employed some, you know, free events, um, how to create an option trading plan, 
um, how to utilize fundamental analysis to find um, stocks that that are are, are good candidates uh, for trading. Um, also, and and to your question, Joe, I, let me you know I'm, I'm playing professor on you, and I apologize. The uh, oh, good. the 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 uh, the you know how the the you know our tools allow them you know to stage orders for very you know for execution on, on a contingent basis uh, you know many of the online brokers do that uh, where you know your your uh, your exit strategy can be figured out in advance um, and you can um, launch you know stage that order with many many order tickets that are conditional orders upon the execution of one. Uh, you know, one position you can either create your spread, or you can create a stop position, a stop order that will uh, close the position. You know, once you've exhausted your uh, downside risk, requ- yeah, you know, requirements, or when you've made your profit target on the top side. So, um, you know, option trading doesn't require that you sit and day trade and 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 watch the position. Um, you can create orders that anticipate the moves um, that are part of your option trading plans. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, you know, uh, education providers already talk about how to create an option trading plan. And uh, those are things that we're going to incorporate into our, uh, our, uh, our introduction option series and the, I want to be a trader series I mean, because options aren't optional. You know, I believe and like you and Mark and many others, uh, that you know that they sh- they are a, a reasonable uh, to you know not a not a excessively uh, uh, risky tool. They 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 have some risk element, of course, and that that's important. But they also can be used to enhance portfolios, and that's what we want people to have um, enhanced portfolios. Indeed, and I uh, I like to say confusing but not complicated when it comes to options you know because as people get started it's a different language you know it's just like anything else you're starting new so i am really a big believer options are not complicated but you know darn confusing you know when you start let me change it up a bit a little bit don um in terms of trends you're seeing in the options business for the retail customer are are there certain you know, areas or, or as I say, trends that you see the, the business moving towards? Well, I think all of uh, the, you know, my other friends at, at, at uh, or my friends at some of the exchanges, especially the futures traders, talk to me about, the, you know, they believe ETFs are, you know, the because they sit right between, you know, kind of a hybrid product between a security and a future, uh, but they have the ability to move uh, very quickly during the day. And because they don't trade like mutual funds, they trade all day long, they, they uh, folks can get in and out of a position and, a, you know, in, in a market segment. Uh, something that they understand and they're comfortable with adding options to an ETF position. As we know, uh, uh, we can give us, you know, can, can give really good enhancement uh, for uh, uh, a portfolio. Um, it, uh, it can, you know, we know that, that they have, you know, many of them have upward and downward movement during the day, that, that component of option premium um, that really kind of dictates whether it's a, a worthwhile investment or not. And so, um, you know, I think uh, trading options on ETFs can be a really, you know, interesting way uh, to, uh, you know, to juice up a portfolio. Well, that, that makes sense. Um, you know, ETFs and options really have uh, – have been growing uh, by leaps and bounds. Any any other you know areas? How about the, like multi-leg strategies, or not so much? Um, well, you know, volatility positions, or, or really that's just kind of more an outlier rather than you know nuts and bolts. One of the things that uh, that you know I I think and I think you you know uh, where you're you know what, what you you know where you're headed with this is, is the idea that, yes, you know, uh, uh, one of the thing, uh, things that can cre- create, um, that can make options less speculative always is spreads. Um, we have uh, a number of other uh, possibilities that, 
you know, to just generate income uh, using weekly options um, and, and, and wing spreads, uh, broken wing butterflies, and et cetera. And, and many of the trading platforms um, allow retail customers, um, depending on their trading level, not, you know, um, advanced wing spreads are not suitable for everybody. Uh, Real quick, but, can, can you, without, without uh, you know, uh, confusing folks, quickly define a broken wing butterfly? Well, uh, the butterfly itself has, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the traditional butterfly, the ones that Joe and I used to execute on trading floors <laughs> at our respective trading floors for customers, had equidistant strikes, um, yep. uh, you know, the wings around the guts. Um, yep. And uh, in, in the, uh, the, the newer ideas, and this is becoming pretty prevalent, I think, in many of the options curriculum that uh, that industry, the industry is, is providing, is that by moving a, a wing farther apart, instead of combining the bull spread and the bear spread in the same position, now you've you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, create a, the two bull spreads or two bear spreads. Do I have that right? I think I do. Yep. Yes, I'm not looking at an option change. <laughs> so um, finding the right strategy and, and the right risk management is really important. Um, so that, you know, what I, what I like about all of the tra- many, many trading platforms, and I'll just say this, not just for TradeStation, uh, but f- uh, on behalf of, you know, a lot of online brokers, is, is the, the ability to trade in a paper trading account. Um, CBOE and the uh, OIC provide a lot of links to those uh, paper trade accounts, allowing people to um, uh, practice their, their craft, getting good at it, um, before they actually go ahead and use their own money um, in, in, a, in the marketplace. Um, and so I think that, yep. that's, a, yeah, that's, that's one way to get comfortable with strategies. Uh, with with you know so that to turn it you know we can always buy puts to protect the portfolio that's kind of the standard one um, you know you and so uh, we can always write calls against uh, stock that we have filling up the hotel <laughs> you know um, I, I had a teacher many years ago who said you know if you're long stock and you're not writing calls against it you know it's like having a hotel and not trying to fill up all the rooms so uh, that's uh, you know, the, the, a, a staple for many folks and, and, and uh, a strategy that we usually, uh, you know, cover first in all of our curriculum. Okay. Um, well, in terms of, uh, not to put you on the spot, but uh, oftentimes we get uh, some interesting answers just in terms of where you think the options business is headed. Uh, and Any strong feelings about that, Don? You know, I, I'm a trading floor guy. Uh, I, I love the idea that you know of the uh, cottage industry that we were uh, able to take advantage of here in Chicago. Um, the uh, idea that we have, um, you know, my I, I think that options have uh, a, a you know a, a very uh, um, uh, important. They'll play a very important role in investors' um, portfolios. Um, you know for the foreseeable future, um, simply because we've gotten very good at, you know, and all, you know, all the exchanges, the, uh, the primary market makers, the specialists in the various exchanges, um, of keeping our systems up. Um, even though we, you know, my, I started to say, um, the, um, that, you know, I always wanted there to be a floor, uh, when I wrote my dissertation years ago, um, uh, for my graduate studies or post or my doctoral work, you know, I, I actually accessed an article at the Philadelphia Exchange and included it in my reference list that said, "Hey, there's always going to be a floor," and I corroborated that with, uh, you know, some of the leaders of the exchanges in, in uh, various interviews that I accessed and, and conducted, where you know I was told that the best thing that you could get in terms of option pricing was that. You know, uh, uh, an experienced risk-taking trader on a trading floor, armed with, uh, you know, efficient and, and effective um, technology. And so the exchanges moved forward to creating technology, and now we have online brokers that actually execute almost as well as we did 
in the old days in the trading <laughs> pits. Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> I was in those pits for a long time. I, I think maybe yeah. it's improved just a little. <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't want to. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't want to get booed off the stage here. Um, I was trying to be diplomatic. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, so, Don, so the technology, uh, yes. you know, once the, I'm sorry, the, uh, you know, the, the broker's houses are competing for that, that retail customer, that, that emerging customer. And so we're all getting better at our offerings. Um, the exchanges are all getting better at their um, at technology and their new products. And, um, you know, it's exciting. Uh, it's a, it's an exciting um, segment to work in. And I'm really happy that, uh, you know, that I've been, that I've been blessed with uh, to have such a long career uh, in the industry. Indeed, Don. I mean, when you, you go back, you talk to SIBO in the, in the eighties, you know, you're talking OEX and, you know, here we are electronic executions where we're doing almost 17 million contracts a day on average. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a different world. So, uh, you know, with that, I would like to, uh, thank you, Don, for, for joining us today. Um, you know, you guys down at trade station do a fantastic job and, um, Again, thanks for joining us, Don, on hey, today's Profiles and Perspectives. It's been my pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me, and I hope to come back. Very good, Don. Take care. It's time to upgrade your options toolbox with cutting-edge trading platforms, devices, and information. It's time for tools, resources, and good reads. In today's Tools, Resources, and Good Reads, we'll start on the OIC website found at optionseducation.org. We want to be sure you know about today's tool, the Position Simulator. This free tool offered by OIC is one that can really take your trading to another level by allowing you to formulate expected profit or losses over time with a change in stock price, volatility, and days to expiration. The simulator is really very intuitive. You'll find it under the Tools and Resources tab on the OIC website homepage. Once into the simulator, enter your positions, both option and stock, if you have any. Then see how profits or losses take place as you move the various inputs. It's a great way to develop realistic expectations around your various positions. That's the Position Fact Simulator, found other tools and resources at optionseducation.org. The resource we'd like to introduce you to today is called briefing.com. This web-based analysis service is for the active trader and is available for a monthly subscription fee. There are three different levels of service to choose from. Three trials are available. And finally, today's good read is a comprehensive guide to strategies and tactics by Russell Rhodes of the CBOE Options Institute. Check it out. Russell does great work. That's today's tools, resources, and good reads. It's time for a nostalgia break. It's time to take a look back. Today's Looking Back, I'd like to offer our listeners a high-level history of the International Securities Exchange, or ISE, which was just purchased by NASDAQ from the Deutsche Börse Group on June 30th. So let's go back in time to May 26th, the year 2000. That's the day the ISE Options Exchange was launched. What was so different about the ISE was that it was the very first electronic exchange. Buyers and sellers were now able to access the options market in a far more efficient way, electronically, versus the effective but less efficient call your broker, who then calls the floor, floor broker on the floor approach to getting an order executed. Far fewer hands had to touch an order in the electronic universe. So what I have seen transformed how many options orders were executed, Business continued to grow significantly with increased options volume and other new offerings at ISC. In March 2005, the exchange went public with an IPO. And in 2007, a mere seven years after it was founded, ISC was acquired by Deutsche Börse. 
for $2.8 billion. Over the years, ISC added the Gemini and Mercury exchanges, as well as FX options and other technologies. And as I mentioned earlier, NASDAQ has acquired ISC from Deutsche Börse for $1.1 billion. ISC continues under the leadership of its new owner. In my mind, the ISC will always be the exchange that most significantly changed how options orders are executed. Thanks for joining us on today's Looking Back. Investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com. Or you can call OIC's Investor Services at 1-888-OPTIONS. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore EDU. Or join their group on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out our next episode of the wide world of options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.